2 Kings chapter 4. I am very excited about today's message. 2 Kings chapter 4. Alright, let me know if the mic's not working. 2 Kings chapter 4. I believe that it will help every single person this sermon. I think it's going to help every single person this sermon. Uh, but if not, then uh, maybe it was just for me. <laughs> But I think this will be a big blessing to each and every one of you. 2 Kings chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 1 through 7. Verses 1 through 7. The passage talks about a widow who is in debt and it's, she's about to lose her sons where they're going to end up as bondmen to the creditor. But Elisha heard her cry and was willing to help her. And she gave what she could in order to give a big increase. And with this increase, she was able to enjoy it for the rest of her life. And a lot of us Christians want that. A lot of us Christians feel like that we're bondmen, that we're doomed to be enslaved to the things of this life or to our flesh and to the world or to negative circumstances. But I want to encourage you widows out there that the Lord hears your cry. And he is willing to help you out. All you do is give what you can, just like this widow did. And he will give a great increase. And you can live the rest of your life enjoying its rewards. Let's read the passage. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in thy house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him, and shut the door upon her, and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, there is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. As you can read from the story, Elisha hearkened to her cry and gave her specific instructions, asking her first, What did she have? She said, All I have is a pot of oil. And Elisha said, Go ahead and use that pot of oil. Go get any other pot out there, borrow not a few, and just fill those pots up with oil. Elisha, are you deaf? I only have one pot of oil. How am I going to fill all those other pots with oil? Just do what I say and just believe and have faith and just try it out. When she did that and started to pour her pot of oil onto the other pots, the Lord just increased it and it just never stopped. And the oil continued on and on and on and the Bible says the oil stayed. Amen. The oil stayed. She has such an increase of it in spite of how little she felt that she had. How little she felt like she can contribute. But it was more than enough. And in the end, she was able to enjoy the rewards of it. She was able to sell those pots of oil because she filled up so many pots with oil. And she sold it, got enough money where she was able to pay off her debt, but at the same time, have leftover where she and her sons can enjoy the rest of their lives. I believe that there are many people who are widows here who went through some kind of suffering and you feel like that you're enslaved to something in this life or into this world. And you feel like that you're doomed and there's nothing else to do. The flesh is like a prison and because of its prison and the world feels like a prison and the minions of hell seem to be on your back and it feels like a prison. And a lot of times we want to accomplish more things for the Lord, give Him the glory do great things, but we feel like that we will never spiritually grow. Are you that person right now who feels like that? 
Are you going through a trial or a test where you feel like you will never get victory? Are you, do you, are you the one who feels like that there's a certain temptation or a struggle that you cannot overcome? There are some of you who feel like you're very little spiritually and you can't contribute much to the Lord. I want to encourage you that those things that you've got, which may be very small, God can turn it into something big. And believe me, you can become a spiritual giant that will grow so much that you'd be surprised when you look years behind you that you're a spiritual champ. And a lot of preachers will tell you that they're not spiritual champs and they'll tell you why. It's because they were like you. They know that journey. They know those trials and tests where they feel like they can never get victory. They feel like there are some hurdles they can't overcome. I don't know about you, but I felt like I could never soul win in my life. Didn't you know that? I felt like I could never win a soul to salvation. And it felt like a prison. I felt like I could never get there. But I tried and I failed miserably many times, but God gave me the victory. Now I led about a thousand souls to salvation in my life. And this is not to boast, but to encourage you that I had just a little pot of oil. And I just poured what I could and God gave the increase. But how do you do that? You'd be very surprised that what you have right now is enough. And God can do something great with it. It's good, brother. Then why is it that I never spiritually grown? There's something in that process you messed up in. That's why. Why is it that the Lord never used it? Well, there's something that the devil hindered you or something that you failed to do. I would like to show you the secret steps, which is actually not really a secret, but very simple steps. Maybe very helpful to you. Maybe very eye-opening and life-changing. It's not something hard. It's not giving extra money to the offering plate. It's not doing extra soul-winning efforts. It's not uh, adding Bible reading or prayer or cutting out sin cold turkey for a couple days. It's much more simple than you think. I pray that today's preaching will help you. The title of my message, and this is the answer all you have to do. Use what you got. Let's pray. Father, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood. God, I am nothing without you. And Lord, even though this is a sermon that I know can help so many people, oh, man, you, I, I think you got the wrong vessel to preach this message. How many more preachers can preach a better message in this one? So I pray that you will be the preacher and not me. I pray you'll reach every heart, for I am incompatible. And I pray you'll help these people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The widow only used what she could. And that's enough. That's enough. Use what you got. My first point is the cry of the widow. The cry of the widow. Look at verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. The very first thing that the widow needed to do so that she can have an increase of the oil, she, so that she can be delivered from this doomed prison that her sons are are about to fall into is to cry out for help to cry out for help it's as simple is to realize that she is in a predicament that she's in trouble and she's supposed to cry out to God for help the problem with many people nowadays is they don't cry out to the Lord for help maybe you did cry out to the Lord for help before but is your heart in it is your heart in it? Like, are you, are you that desperate where in verse 1, her sons are about to become bondmen? Do you feel like that when you cry out for help? Or is it, Lord, just give me victory over this temptation, over this struggle. Help me to do this spiritual thing in Jesus' name. Amen. Or is it like prayer meeting? Oh, I have a prayer request. You know, I'm going through a hard time. Help me. No, 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 no. It's supposed to be a cry to God. A cry. Not just words, but a cry to God, recognizing you are in a doomed, in a bad scenario. 
You know why God never answered your prayer? You don't think you're in a doomed scenario. Why did my problem keep increasing? So that God can get your attention, do you finally realize you're in a doomed scenario? That's why God increases your pain. God increases uh, the problem you're going on in your life because you don't realize how bad of a scenario you're in. One thing I've learned in preaching and pastoring for a long time and even looking at myself with my own issues, whenever people want help or solutions in life, they don't really need it, to be honest. Okay. They don't really need it because they don't, realize, they don't see that they are in such a bad situation that they'll do anything for help. Because you're still too full and need of nothing as a layout to say on Christian. And that's why God increases the pain. That's why God increases the predicament and the trouble so that you can finally open your eyes and realize, okay, I realize I can't do things my way. I am desperate. God, I have nothing to use. And God, I need your help. But see, you still rely on your own understanding, your own wisdom to take care of your problems. That's why God has not answered your help. Imagine if the widow, she already had some things going on for her where she was paying off her debt and then she said, Elisha, I need help. And then Elisha's like, no, 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 you're taking care of yourself. You're building up money for yourself. Why do you need my help? If she really needed his help, she has nothing. She is in a pickle. She can't build up money herself. She's like, uh, uh, I need your help. If she really needed his help. There's another thing right here. Thy servant did fear the Lord. Do you see that, verse 1? The thing where God can help you with your cry is there's something in you that fears him, that serves him. You know, a lot of people get discouraged. A lot of people feel like that, you know, God's not answering my prayer. God's not going to help me out with this situation. So I'm going to do things my way. And the devil's going to use that trick on you. Because you feel like that you're not spiritual enough. You feel like you're not up there as much, committed as much, surrendered enough to the Lord. But... The verse points out right here that thy servant did fear the Lord. You know what I believe? I believe this. Deep down inside your heart, there is something in you that does fear the Lord. I know you're backslidden. I know you're fleshly. I know you're messed up. But I know there's something deep down inside your heart you do fear the Lord. You might say, why is that? Otherwise, you wouldn't get saved. You fear an eternal hell fire and you want to be saved from hell. You know why I believe that? I believe that because you're here at church today. Because you know it's the right thing to do and something, uh, the Lord's not going to bless your life. You fear that. I know that there's something in your heart that fears the Lord. Why? Because you would pray to Him. You would cry out for help. If you really didn't fear Him, you'd do things your own way. So I want to encourage you that God hears your cry. Because there's something inside you that does... Fear Him. But that's the devil's tool is to take away that fear of the Lord from you and make you rely on your own flesh, your own ways, and make you feel at peace and make you feel like that there's stability in drinking that liquor and going by your schedule and your plan and saving up money your way where it can build up for your future and you find peace with that. That's the devil's trick. And you lost your fear of the Lord that way. You've got to believe and that is your problem. The reason why a lot of people don't get help from the Lord is they never had faith to begin with. That's why you don't cry out to God for help. That's why you do things your own way. That's why you gave up going that route of seeking God's help is because you no longer believe in Him. Let me tell you something. You are on the most dangerous ground ever. The most dangerous ground ever is disbelief. Out of everything. You can backslide. You can mess up over and over again. You can be hooked to something dark and sinful. But a greater danger than all that put together is your disbelief. You might say, why is that? Because faith is the most basic ingredient 
where God can answer accordingly to your faith and help you out. If you don't believe, then it's going to be very natural and easy for you to do things your own way. But if you believe in God, in His Word, and preaching, that's why you'll at least pray to Him one time, even though you're backslidden, you don't pray often. That's why, if you believe that sin, there is a judgment, that's why there is some fear of the Lord in there, even though sometimes you're immune and keep committing the sin over and over again. If there is a belief in there, about the judgment seat of Christ and that God promises that He'll take care of the issue, that's why you'll still keep coming to church here and there, even though not often. Read the Word of God here and there, even though not often. One thing I notice with people is once they don't have that faith in the Lord, it's game over. But if you have that in you, if you have that in you, then the Lord can start answering. Yes. Don't, you can't, uh, stop going to church, stop reading the Word, stop praying until you get your heart right with God first. Do I have some, at least, some so form of faith and fear in there? And if there's none of that, that's why He's not going to take care of you. I'm not asking for 100% faith or 100% fear. I don't think that, I think even the most perfect Christian is not 100%. So at least have some level of faith, at least have some level of fear where God can hear your cry and answer you. If you don't have that and you abandon all hope on that one, that's why God's not helping you. And you can attend all the church services you want without faith, without any fear of the Lord. This preaching is going one year out the other. You're not going to come on the altar and feel any conviction whatsoever, no matter how powerful my last illustration might be. You need fear and you need faith, at least some form in there. Then God will help you. Can I encourage you that much? Do you have at least that much in you? My second point is the calling of the widow. The calling of the widow. Look at verse 2. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I uh, do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. You notice what God requires out of you? Well, Elisha asked her, uh, What can I do for you? Uh, what do you have in your home? And she said, I have got nothing but a pot of oil. Notice that God's like, uh, if we were to compare this passage with the Lord, God is not like, okay, what do you have? Well, all I have is, you know, all I can do is this much for you, God. And God's not like interrogating and going, no, 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 no. Uh, you got something more and then you could do this much more for me, that much more for me. It's not like God told you as soon as you get saved, okay, go out street preaching, one, two, three, go. <laughs> Yeah. It's not like as soon as you get saved, God's like, okay, uh, commit to this much Bible and prayer, one, two, three, go. It's not like as soon as you get saved, okay, these sins, get rid of it, one, two, three, go. No, the Lord, what He asks is, what can you do for me? Yeah. What have you got? Yeah. Well, um, you know, Lord, uh, I mean, I'm not like pastor or that Christian, the church who can do that much, but I can do this little thing for you. Maybe I could pray in the morning. Maybe I could give one track. Uh, maybe I can go to that to one church service and, and God's saying, what have you got? Right. Now, what can you offer to the Lord? He's asking you right now, what have you got? What can you offer me? And I think that's the reason why a lot of Christians don't grow is because they keep thinking about a lot of things that they fail to do that they should be doing rather than looking at the things that they can do, that they are able to do, and they don't even do those things. Why don't they do those things? Because they keep looking at this big stuff that they got to do. That's why you're not even doing the small things for the Lord. And that's my second point, the calling of the widow. God's calling you. What have you got? Sure, can you do more? Okay. You failed on this one? Sure, and maybe you should do better? Okay, I get all that, but at least 
At least when God calls you, what can you do for me? What can you promise to do for me today? What can you, can't you at least do that and say, Lord, I'll at least pray to you this morning. Yes. Lord, at least I'll go to this one service today. Lord, at least, can you at least do that much? When God calls you, he's asking you, what have you got that you can do for me? God, I can't do so winning. And no, 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 no. What can you do for me? I'm not asking you what you can't do. What can you do for me? Okay. You know, the Bible says, uh, There hath no temptation to you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able? But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it? The Bible says, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God promised... God promised. He's not going to give you a burden greater than you can bear. Amen. God promised. He promised He'll give you special grace yes. for even the hardest things in life. Yes. Now, what I don't get is, why don't you even use those things for the Lord? You keep looking at the big things, the things that you think are impossible that you cannot do for the Lord. Stop thinking about what you cannot do for the Lord. Stop thinking about the things you cannot do for the Lord. Why don't you start thinking about the things you can do for the Lord? Be infatuated. Be obsessed. Concentrate yourself on the things you can do for the Lord rather than the things you cannot do for the Lord. Amen. But these are things I cannot do that I should be doing. Yeah, and I should be 100% holy without a dirty thought, without a wrong thought, without a wrong emotion today. Yeah. That's what I should be doing, but I can't do that. Right. I'm looking at the things I can do, though. That's good. Keep myself in a clean, clean environment. Okay. Hear preaching so that I can be able to motivate myself again. Read that word so I can clean up my heart and my mind. Pray to Him so at least God can put boundaries on me. I can do that much. Why don't you think about the things that you can do for the Lord? Well, I can't witness to a soul. Give a track. Can you do that? Well, I can't give it to a person. I'm too scared. Leave it at the restaurant. All right? Well, I can't do that. And think about it. And there's God, I know this, okay? God knows this and you know this. He's calling you. What can you do for me? Your problem is you don't want to answer that question. There is something simple. There is something easy. There is something you can do, but you're refusing that call of God. That's plain and simple. Yeah, that's good. Now stop thinking about things I can't do, I can't do, I can't do. Everyone has zero excuse at the judgment seat of Christ. God starts not with the things that you can't do, not with the big things. God starts with what you can do, what you can bear, and the little things, and it's always little things he starts out with. Now, what can you do? What can you do? Leave it at a gas pump. Run away 100 miles per hour in your car, okay? And then see how the Lord gives the increase after that. Okay. Amen, Have the guts to just wake up earlier in the morning and drag yourself to church. And then see what God does after that. Right. Have the guts and then find something. There is something where you can dodge that sin and that temptation. Why don't you... Start answering God's call and tell Him what you can do. Amen. God is asking you, what do you have? What can you give to me? You're just not answering His call. That's your problem. This is good. Amen. My third point is the companions of the widow. The companions of the widow. Look at verse 3. Then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. Notice that Elisha tells the widow, Hey, go ask your companions, your neighbors out there uh, for empty vessels and don't borrow a few. That's really good. That's really good. Okay, you know how you can use what you got? I'll tell you how you can use what you got. You need help. Okay. Can I repeat that again? You need help. See, we're back to that first point again. That first point, you have to realize that you're in trouble, you're in a predicament, you can't help yourself. Right. And that's why you cry out to God for help. 
All right, so then God gives you help. All right, here's the preaching that you need. Here's the teaching that you need. Here are brothers and sisters in Christ in church. Here is my word. Here is prayer or whatever opportunity God gives you a way to escape the trial, to escape the temptation. But it's plain and simple. You think you don't need those things. And then you always resort to, I have my own way. Oh, I can handle it. What happened to the first point? God, I need help. I can't handle it. And then at the moment, God gives you help. Oh, I can handle it. You know, that's the problem with people nowadays. The problem with people is God knows that you can't help yourself, so he's providing you help. Whatever situation or thing or people, I mean, God has provided you companions to help you with your problem, but you reject those companions. I guarantee you this, every person falls in and messes up with the same struggle in life because that book is collecting cobwebs on that shelf because they feel like they don't need it that morning. That they do not need prayer first thing in the morning. Yes. And God has given you companions in life. People think that they don't need the pastor's preaching. They don't need the teaching that day where they write down notes to help themselves that God is giving to them. Where they have fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to bear the burdens and with the pastor providing counsel and older people providing counsel. They feel like they don't need these things. And that's the reason why you're stuck in that deep trouble and that trouble is growing even bigger. You might say, why is that trouble growing bigger? Because God wants you to fall to that basic first point. I need help. You're not there yet. Okay. You need to realize, I desperately need help. And then when God gives you the companions, then use it. Remember the second point? God's calling you, what can you do? Yes. What can you do? And you've admitted, I can't do this, I can't do that. So because you admitted to God, I can't do these big things, then God's like, here, I'll give you help. Oh, no, no, I can do it, God, I can do it. And That's why you never spiritually grow. It's so amazing. God never asked something big or complicated. He provided simple means. But human nature complicates the simple means that God has provided. You know why you keep messing up that cycle over and over again and you're never free from that predicament and problem? You failed already the three simple steps. You already failed that so far. Do you need help? Do you need help? Then be humble. Be humble enough. Swallow your pride and realize I am desperate. I need help. I'm about to be in prison. My family's about to be bond servants to this creditor. Help me. I got nothing. Yeah, I'll put my things away. My plan's away. Here, give me. I'll take whatever you give to me. If you're never there, God will never give it to you. God is never interested to provide help for people who don't want his help. Okay. Do you want help? Then take it. Amen. My fourth point is the commission of the widow. The commission of the widow. This is really good right here. You'll notice that the widow has a mission. She has a task. She has a commission to accomplish something. In verse 4, this is her commission. And when thou art come in, Thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shalt pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. All right. So Elisha told her what to do. You go inside, shut the door and, you know, just pour the oil in the vessels. And those vessels that are full, then put it aside. If she follows these directions, she will succeed and her oil will increase. Notice these factors. Pay attention to verse 4. Now, this is not deep, okay? This is simple. This is not deep. This is simple. Like I told you before, human nature complicates things. That's the reason why we never get victory. We just overlook the simple things. All right, here we go. 
I'm going to go through the simple things. Amen. And you're going to go, oh, oh, wow, I never thought of that before. And it's not deep. This is how she's going to get her oil to increase. This is how she's going to get victory. This is how she's going to make it. Verse 4, she goes inside. If she goes inside, rather than going outside of the door, or she's not supposed to leave her home. She's supposed to stay at home. Okay? Think about it. If she leaves home, she's not going to fill up the, oil, uh, the pots with oil, right? So just stay in there. Just stay in the house so that you can fill up the pot with oil. Simple, right? Here's another one. Thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. All right, so make sure you shut the door. Don't let anyone in. Don't let anything hinder you. And just pour the oil on the vessels. It's a guarantee. It's a guarantee if she shuts out everything that would hinder or bother her, the oil should fill up, right? It's pretty simple. It's so simple. How simple is it? Any child and five-year-old can do it. Close the stinking door. Shelter in place. Shelter in place. <laughs> Shelter in place. Do, it, do a lockdown. <laughs> Notice right here, and shall pour out into all those vessels. Okay, so you have a bunch of vessels you borrowed, right? Start filling them up. If you fill up all of them, think about it, the, probably she got, I don't know, 50 vessels, 100 vessels she borrowed from her neighbors. If she filled all of them up with oil, isn't it a guarantee that, oh, I have an increase of oil, right? <laughs> one pot versus 100 pot of oil, which one's an increase? The 100 pot. Isn't that easy? So it's just very easy. Just pour it into the 100 pots and you'll have an increase. All right, this is duh, isn't it? So far, so good. And thou shalt set aside that which is full. If you got the full one, don't break it. Don't waste it. Just put it aside and it's a guarantee. Wow, I have a full pot of oil. Now, what's my point here? My point is she did these simple things. Simple things that guaranteed she would have an increase of oil. Right. And it must happen. The increase has to happen. If she shut the door, fill up 100 pots of oil, just kept pouring it, and make sure she didn't leave the house. It's a promise. It's a guarantee she's going to increase the oil, right? All right, then I have a question for you. When God told you the simple things to do for him spiritually to fill up your oil, isn't it a guarantee that you have to increase? Yeah. It's a guarantee. Then why aren't you doing it? Because you think it's too simple. That's right. Come on. Ooh. That's your problem. That's yeah. good. Because you think it's too simple. Or, here's an even more shocking truth. You ready for this? You're not, you don't even have a plan or simple things in your mind what to do for the Lord. Okay. Yeah. Think about it. If you read that book, first thing in the morning, or you pray to him, even just five minutes, something so small, first thing in the morning. How can you go on 10 years that way without spiritually increasing? That is utterly impossible. Oh. Oh, the only thing I can do, I can't pray that long and I can't read the Bible that much. I can only do uh, maybe one chapter or just five minutes of prayer and okay, then use that for me, said the Lord. Go ahead and do it. But you don't even do that. Why? Because you feel like it's too small. You feel like it's not enough. That's why you never grow. Wow, that's good. That's but it's a guarantee. I promise you, if you do that first thing in the morning, I guarantee you this, you will grow. You know why you don't spiritually grow? You don't even do the little things. Wow. You, like I said at the second point, the calling of the widow. When God calls, what can you do for me? You don't even do that. Wow. You don't even do that. Is it too hard to shut off one program of your favorite television show? Is it so hard to skip one day of that internet and video and the cable TV? Is it so hard to just go on your knees and pray for five minutes? Is it so hard for you to attend every Sunday service? Is it that hard for you? That's good. Is it that hard for you? 
Why can't you just do the simple things that guarantee growth? The problem with people is this. Do you have a list of simple things you can do for the Lord that will guarantee to grow? Do you have a list of simple things that you can do? I never said what you can't do. I never said, you know, what I can do, what Max can do, what Robert can do, or Daniel Seeley can do. No, 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 no. I'm talking about your own walk, your own ability, what you can do. I don't care how pathetic, spiritually pathetic and weak you are, okay? The point is, at least be humble enough to admit, I am that pathetic. Okay, I'm that pathetic. I'm that weak. This is all I can do. Okay, then do that for the Lord. Do you have a list? You don't even do them, do you? You never wrote that list, do you? Okay. Why can't you do that list? If you have a list, does that list guarantee natural growth? Mm, okay, all right. I've, uh, I've seen people where they just faithfully come to visitation. They don't sow in. I, and then they just come to visitation. They see other people sow in. And then I've seen it before where one sister, after two years of visitation, starts to witness. Why? Because that sister never neglected visitation. Just went. That's it. Just went. And she started witnessing. To people naturally. Why? It's a simple thing that guarantees growth. Do you do that? Do you do the simple things that guarantee growth? Now, isn't that motivating? Imagine you don't have to put so much pressure on yourself, okay, when you start out your day for the Lord, okay? Just think about things that you're motivated to do. Think about things that are simple and easy for you to do. Not complicated, not hard. Tell your stupid, stinking, wretched, lazy, backsliding flesh, come on, man, just five minutes? Just one minute? You fool, man, just do that. And then, oh, you can do whatever you want after that, all right? Just start it that way and see what God can do after that. You know, there are times that my flesh is just so weak that I'll find simple motivating things that'll get me to serve the Lord. You know, there are days I just don't want to go to church. But why do I go to church? I'll go to church because just a simple motivating factor. I'll just think about my brother and sister in Christ. Okay. What they'll think of me. I don't have to think about being faithful and then, you know, finding an excuse to be sick and skip and stuff like that. I just have to think about that. And then I'll drag my flesh and drag myself to church. Or if there's a trial or a temptation that's hard for me to bear, I just tell myself, before you mess up your day, let's pray to the Lord. Yes. Then, go, then go ahead. Yes. Have at it. Then see how the Lord spiritually grows that. Do, uh, you know, there are times I don't like reading the Bible. I know, shocking, right? I know, I'm so backslidden. Oh, your pastor is just so messed up. So, I have an app. I'll have it narrate to me with music. And I just get lost into the Word and then just hear that Word over and over and then start reading into that Word after that. Right, right, right. You know, what is it? Simple, yeah. simple, yeah. motivating things that I can do yeah. and I know I can do. Yes. And I know I can do. And then see how the Lord spiritually increases wow. after that. Yeah, yeah. that's good, man. How should you live your Christian life is after this altar call, don't think about, man, i got to make a full-time commitment and something complicated. Make a list. when you Don't come to this altar until you make a list of, I know these are the most simplest things and things that I can do and even something that can motivate me to serve God. Right. In soul winning, in spending time in fellowship with Him, in going to church, in staying away from sin, in studying more and growing more in knowledge. It's time that you make a list this time, and that's your commission. Your commission today is to make this list of simple things that will guarantee spiritual growth, and you are guaranteed that I can at least do this much today. That's good. 
Isn't that easy? Yes. But see, you never took the time off your day to do that. Wow. And that's why you still are spiritually stunted. And you can't grow. My fifth point is the closure of the widow. The closure of the widow. And what I mean by closure is closing. It's closed. This is why you backslide and mess up. You ready for this? This is the big one right here. Look at the next verse. Verse 5. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out. She had a commission that she was able to do. It wasn't really hard. Elisha never said, go street preaching. Elisha said, borrow jars, shut the door and fill it up. Isn't that easy? Okay, this is something I can do. All right, then I'll do that. When she did that, she shut the door. Why did she shut the door? So that no one bothers her. You know what your problem is? Your problem is you open your door so much to the world, to the flesh, to sin, and that devil whispering in your ear. See, that's not enough spiritual work for the Lord. Oh, what do you think, pastor, and the church will think about that? Oh, you know, you're just backslidden. Remember, you messed up yesterday. You're going to mess up today. And, oh, man, isn't that trial so heavy? And you're going to have another big one. Oh, there's a lot of fear right there. You got to shut the door of the enemy and the hindrances and don't let anything bother you and be, stick up your head high and be proud to at least leave a track at a gas pump and then say, I've done my task today. And then drive away. You know what? You let hindrance come in. You let hindrance come in. Whew. Oh, man. You never led a soul to salvation. And you've seen what Brother Jonathan did. 100 souls that month, you know. Yeah. You're a backslider. You're not right with God. And then you'll go. And then you hardly, you won't even leave a track at the gas pump station. But if you shut that door and said, hey, that's his calling. That's not mine. I already wrote a list of what I'm going to do. Yes. Leave a track at the unleaded gas station that's number 87 and put it at that pump and walk away. Yeah. And shut the door. That's good. That's good. I like that. But you open the door. You open the door. Something robbed you of your time. Here comes laziness. As soon as you wake up in the morning, ah, uh, you know. Why bother praying? Why bother reading the word? You know, it's just uh, too hard. You know, you're not going to read three chapters. You know, that prayer is just uh, long-winded and uh, no, 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 no. See. You, you, you let the devil come in and give you something complicated to discourage you from serving God. You already made a list. I'm going to do at least five minutes, so shut up, lazy flesh, and shut the door. Oh, I can't go soul winning today because it's so tough, and oh, I'm just, work is so tough. I am just too busy, and whoa, 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 what are you thinking? about no you're not thinking about that you're thinking about hey I made a commitment I made a commitment I'm just gonna go to visitation that day that's it I don't have to win a soul to salvation I don't have to do something big or special just go to a one hour just a one hour visitation service just get your tail over there and shut the door yeah. you know what your problem is you never drew you never in all your life drew a non-compromising line. I failed, I messed up, I've sinned so many times, but I drew one line that I'm happy about. I drew one line right here, and my line is, I cannot skip a service, period. Period! And when all the gates of hell open up on me and try to make me skip and to bail out, I say, nah, I can't budge! And I shut the door. That's good. What your problem is? You never drew a non-compromising line in all your life. Look, I never said for you to stop sinning and to be pure and then uh, change your whole lifestyle and attitude and uh, your Bible reading prayer and everything goes amped up. I never said that. What can you do? God's calling you. That's good. What can you do? Did you make a simple list? That will guarantee growth? Okay, then did you draw a line after that? 
I am not going to compromise on that. I am not going to skip that. I'm not going to let anything hinder me from completing this job. That's your problem. You never drew a line. Hey, I never said draw an uncompromising line where it's so tough and it's so hard to fight for the Lord, to be strong in the name of Jesus because the world's so tough. Just shut up. Just shut up and realize that, hey, I made a list that's simple that I can do. I can do this, but now I need to draw a line that the things that I can do, I will never compromise on that. I never said to do th things that you can't do and you commit on the altar. Oh God, you know, I'll stop sinning and I'll do this more and I'll do that. No, no, I never said that. And then you draw a non-compromising line and you have to faithfully do that. No, 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 no. Get on this altar, make a list of things you can do. I don't care how weak it is. I don't care how pathetic it is. At least be honest and admit, I am that weak and pathetic. Amen. So here's my list, God. And if I do these small things, it will naturally grow. I believe in that. So I will commit to this and I will not compromise on this. And let all the temptations of the world and the flesh shut out. I don't care how discouraged you are. I don't care how bad your attack is. Or even if all the gates of hell pour out against you, draw a line and say, this is what I can do. Nothing's going to stop me from doing this. That's your problem. You never drew a non-compromising line. You got to draw a non-compromising line. Do you have one? Do you have one? Do you have one? Here, here, let me, uh, let me help you, okay? I will not commit murder. Can you all do that? Well, you can't draw a line on that one? Then I would be scared to death if I were you. That's your problem. You never drew a non-compromising line on something easy and something you can do for the Lord. Draw a non-compromising line, I can do this much. Something easy, easy. Stop being complicated. Do something easy and small for the Lord and draw a non-compromising line. And how can you not spiritually grow more after that? How can, not God, how can God not increase you after that? You know why He never increased you? Because on those simple, basic things, you compromised. Simple, basic, easy things that you can do, you compromised. And you complicated those simple, easy things. You made it too much of a hard work to you. Yeah. That's your problem. Uh, my sixth point, the continuance of the widow. The continuance of the widow. Notice at verse 6, this is really important right here. Everything is important so far, so this is just as important. Verse 6, And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There's not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Verse 6, you notice she didn't let anything hinder her. Verse 5, she let nothing hinder her. Nothing's going to stop her. She kept filling up those vessels with oil until there was no more vessel to fill. And the Bible says the oil stayed. In other words, it stayed that way. It stayed full. But it was so, so small. What happened? It's so small little things that naturally grew. Remember that? Yes. Only small, easy, simple steps that you know you can do, that you guarantee you can handle. Just do it bit by bit. What happens? It builds on top and it grows. Yes. And then when you look back 10 years of your life, you go, oh, wow, I already read through the Bible this many times. Oh, wow, I led this many souls to salvation. I passed out how many tracks? No way. Oh, wow, I, you know, I haven't sinned for this many days on that same struggle I used to. Wow, I, what, that's what happens. It dramatically increases, and there is a drastic improvement from small little things. That's encouraging, isn't it? That is very encouraging. And let me tell you something is, it stayed there. That's important, verse 6. Right. It stayed there. You know why you keep backsliding? It's so simple. You don't stay there. I commit to one Sunday service and then 
what happens? Then it's, uh, you've been doing that for about probably a couple months and then you skip, you failed in your commitment on that. And then it's been several weeks and then you start over again. You know what the point is? The point is, if you made a small commitment, whatever that commitment is, and maybe it is attending that Sunday service, okay? You have to stay consistent. You cannot skip. You cannot give gaps. Why? Because then your growing process starts all over again. I noticed that when I was doing uh, discipleship and then noticing teachers in classes, that's why they make a very big deal on absences. Yeah. You know why? Because they know that the progress, that the training they're doing where they're growing, it just starts all over again or they forgot what they've learned. That's why it's so important to stay consistent. Oh, it's so hard to be faithful, Pastor. And whoa, 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 whoa. I never said uh, stay faithful on these complicated things you can't do. I'm talking about the things you can do right. that you know you can handle. Okay, if you can handle them, why are you not consistent with that? Okay. That's why you keep backsliding. You repeat a cycle. I guarantee you this. If you keep doing small things with huge gaps in between, you're not going to grow. Right. But if these small things build up day by day and you have a certain pattern that I commit to, I will not compromise and it stays that way, I promise you within two years, you should be growing way more after that. That's good. I promise you. That's true. But why haven't I grown? You put gaps. You didn't stay there. You didn't stay there. You have to continue. Look, uh, just don't let the devil discourage you. Oh, it's so hard or oh, it's so difficult or you, you got a long ways to go. And uh, no, no, no. Just stay motivated on, man, I can't believe it. I led that one soul to salvation. Oh, I'm just, oh, I actually witnessed to somebody. Wow. And just enjoy what you got. And the devil might go, oh, you know, you're kind of little fleshly there where... You know, you only read the Bible because there was music in the background or you only went to church that day because of the brethren there who encouraged you or you know, who cares? Shut the door. Right. All right. Shut the door. Whatever they say. Sure. He might be telling the truth. Don't the devil tell the truth half the time? Yeah. OK. What should Eve? What should Eve have done when Satan was telling half truth? Ignore him. Shut the door. Okay, who cares what the devil says is true or is false? Just ignore him. You're more important than the devil, okay? Pay attention to yourself and think about, this is what I got. I'm enjoying my Christian walk. I'm enjoying fellowship. I'm enjoying my Bible reading, my prayer life. I'm enjoying the simple things, the small things of life where I can do something for the Lord. I am happy. Stay that way. Amen. Just stay that way and enjoy it. Keep it simple and easy. You got me? As a pastor, it's easy to complicate things. I feel like, man, I got to do this more in my ministry, that much more in my ministry. One thing I learned is, no, just one at a time. Keep it simple and easy and let the Lord give the increase. He never fails every time. I just have to stay that way. Where the devil, uh, do you have a small commitment? When the devil sends me that one major attack, like Dennis Knowles mentioned, right? Like you got one life to live where there's something that you don't want to go through that you can finally go through for the Lord. Do you have that, that small thing you can commit to the Lord? Put, uh, that helped me a lot. I would put one attack. Just one attack. Just one. Just one attack to go through for the Lord today. That's good. Just one attack to bear, to grip my teeth. Just, just one for the Lord that day. And I went through so many. Keep it simple and easy. Don't complicate it. Don't make it big. Don't make it like oh, something you can't handle. Make it simple and make it easy. That's good. Make it something you can motivate yourself. This is at least what I can handle. Yes, make it that way and stay that way. Yeah. And I promise you, you become a champ after that. Okay. But you put gaps, you revert back the process, you'll never grow. 
My seventh point is the capital of the widow. The capital of the widow. Look at her capital. She has such an increase. Verse 7. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. Isn't it amazing? She got such an increase of oil that Elisha told her, Live the rest of the capital that you gained from selling the oil for your pleasure, for enjoyment for you and your family. Think about all that little oil you poured. There's got to be at least some reward out of that that the Lord has given to you. There's got to be at least a small blessing from what you prayed to Him somewhere. Oh, but it's small and it's pathetic. Look, I know that you reap what you sow when you sin. Even the smallest sin, correct? You reap what you sow. Shouldn't it be the same thing for the smallest good deed for the Lord? That's good, brother. Amen. If you do, then what have you reaped the reward for that small deed you did for the Lord? Oh, I could probably tell you this. You probably ignored it. That's why. But if you were to count every small thing the Lord gave to you for every struggle you overcame, you'd live your life more happily. Yeah, yeah. The problem with people is discontentment, dissatisfaction. And because of that, people live in an endless depressed cycle of dissatisfaction. You know, I, when I think about what God has rewarded me for even the small things I did for Him, I can't help but be happy and thankful for what I have. But you know, that ungrateful attitude and the devil, he always puts in making life complicated, hard, and too big of a gap where we feel like I need something more to satisfy me. No, you deserved hell with all the crud that you committed. You deserve far worse. Thank God he didn't give you what you deserved with your evil doing. And thank God that he at least gave you the small handfuls. Yes. And why don't you cherish those small handfuls? Right. Man, every moment of fellowship, every small increase financially, every moment of peace, just one day of even, uh, just one day of spending time with my own family or to myself to relax, just thank you, Lord. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord. And that one victory that you've given to me. And that one reward you've given to me for that small effort I did. One soul saved means so much to me, Father. Yes, yes. One fruit gained from that ministry means so much to me, Heavenly Father. Why not just revel and enjoy the reward that you have? Yeah. And you don't realize that some of those small blessings that you've got, some of them are permanent even. But you take it for granted. And God, if you're not careful, God will take those small blessings of yours away. Whether it be your living, uh, your home that God has blessed you with, your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ God has blessed you with. I don't know what He gave you that small blessing. If I were you, I cherish it. Yes, yes. But God can take it away if you're not happy. Discontentment is one of the worst things in life. And because of that, people seek after more into the world and then they lay off their small duties for the Lord. There is one thing I'd like to close this sermon with is this case of living for the Lord. Service to the Lord should not be hard for you. Why, you might ask. Because when people live their life in sin and into the world, they don't just put both feet all in. What they do is little things. Everybody in life starts out with little things, even in sin, yes. even in the flesh, yes. and in the world. You never complicated that. You just enjoyed the moment. You just rode with it, however your flesh felt with those little things. And just let it naturally grow into the big and deeper uh, fleshly things, didn't you? Yes. Now, I got a question. If the Holy Spirit gives you these small things to do, why can't you just ride the wave and the moment and just enjoy those small spiritual things that you're doing yes. and let it naturally grow? Right. 
where now you're deep into the Holy Spirit and you accomplish big things. People who are messed up into a backsliding stage or in the flesh or in sin don't become that way overnight. Because they've done little things that they were able to do that they never complicated and took it naturally and simply as an everyday thing and they did it so faithfully, consistently. That's why this world ended up in a dark apostasy. It took small little things every day. Why can't you do that with the Holy Spirit? Okay. Come on. Okay. I mean, you don't put both feet in into the big things of the Holy Spirit. It's just like your flesh. You just start off with those little things and just enjoy those times, those moments of fellowship, those moments of fellowship with God, fellowship with brethren, and, you know, uh, endeavoring to win souls and staying away from sin and, you know, just, those, just ride the wave and yes. enjoy those little moments and let the Holy Spirit naturally grow. And you become a great spiritual giant for the Lord. It all comes down to use what you got. The calling of the widow, as I mentioned before, God is asking you, what have you got? What can you do for me? It's time for you to come on this altar and make a list of those things, of what you can do, and then draw a line right here on this altar and say, God, I am not going to cross this line. And then you stay consistent and faithful in that and let God reward and bless your life. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open.